اعوذ بالله من الشیطان الرجیم بسم الله الرحمن الرحیم الحمد لله رب العالمین الذي هدانا لهذا وما كنا لنهتدي لولا ان هدانا الله والصلاة والسلام على اشرف الانبیاء والمرسلین شفیع ذنوبنا وطبیب نفوسنا وحبیب قلوبنا ابی القاسم محمد وآلہ الطیبین الطاہرین المعصومین واصحابہ المنتجبین ومن تبعہم بإحسان لا قیام یوم الدین بسم اللہ الرحمن الرحیم رب شرح لی صدری ویسر لی عمری وحل لقدتا من لسانی یفقہ قولی اما بعد السلام علیکم جمعا ورحمت اللہ وبرکاتہ اعظم اللہ وجورنا وجورکم بمسابنا بیابی عبد اللہ الحسین علیہ السلام So the role of God in this life of ours given the verses that we have presented is to regulate our lives and to bring us to a point of success this is what God wants we have created our own problems this life of ours is a huge huge bestowal and a huge favor from God it is not to be taken lightly least of all no finger should point at God to say why did you create me in this oppressive life no it's a favor from God we have very little knowledge as the Quran says but if we use our minds and our intuition and we read the Quran closely we will know that God is needless he doesn't need this if you disbelieve in God and all those upon earth it will make no difference to God the Quran says غني ذو الرحمة needless full of mercy but not only God those lofty beings that are at play around the arsh they are seeking forgiveness لمن في الارض for people upon the face of the earth they actually sympathize with us and God has left the door of return to him open and encourages the very fact that the Quran says it was indeed a favor of God upon the people that he sent his messenger if sending the messenger for our guidance is a favor then it shows we do not deserve it and it also shows therefore that God has not created us in the naive way that we feel that he has just created us in which case guiding us would be an onus upon God in the first instance. The Quran would not say we would have given every soul its guidance and none would have been hell bound. The Prophet used to spend sleepless nights worrying, praying and begging the Meccans to believe in God. There is a lot going on here. The verse would come, Prophet, worry not. Had God wanted, he would have guided them all. There are things you may not be aware of right now. Of course, the Prophet grew with his experiences and the Prophet became that tower of understanding, that beacon of light as he grew through his prophetic experience. But the Wahi consoled him. There is something else going on here. Just do your job. The Quran says, it's your task to preach. It is our task to guide. Don't worry about it. We know what is happening very well. There has been something else that has happened, and now they are here. Now, the role of God, nobody should misunderstand. The role of God is a positive role in our lives. He wants to liberate us. Liberate us from what? From a captivity in which we have fallen. It's such an intense captivity in which we have fallen, in a state of enslavement. And God wants to bring us out of it. But you have to communicate these truths in a way in which people can really emerge out of captivity. A seed looking at a tree and says, I am a tree, does not make the seed into a tree. The seed has to be buried beneath the earth. It has to break its chest apart. It has to allow the tree to germinate as an infant and then grow. Spread out its branches and leaves and then fruit become a fruit bearing tree. That's the process in which we are. 
and the beautiful farmer who is our God waters it, curls it through tests and brings us to our fullness. God is there as a parent. But God is also going to regulate our lives as a master, as an instructor. He will also dispense with justice as a judge. The central theme of the Quran has been everything is going on out there, in there, around you, things that you don't understand. But the key to your success and salvation and for you to make it from this phase of your existence is to cut through the veils and see only God, be directed to God fully. So this world is a favor. Now people ask me, why does God talk so severely? I gave, we gave one response, that God ordained the Quran, but who has phrased it? Who has rendered it into the Arabic language? And we've spoken about this extensively in previous years, and they're all written these lectures. So sometimes the severity of the tone does not reflect the sentiment of God. Yet the severity of the tone is in place because this is how it needed to be said. A child smoking a cigarette needs a slap at that age. They will hate the parent for it. They will curse the parent for it. When they grow up, they will say, why didn't you slap me a few times more? Honestly, when my great uncle used to tell me off, my God, when he grew older and I became a teenager, I said to him, said, well, you should have told me off far more than what you did. I was petrified of you. And that is what had kept me on the right path. Why didn't you show more severity to me? It's worked. Today we go to their graves and we cry. We say, I know how difficult it must have been for you to be so harsh. <laughs> you, know? you must have put a rock on your heart. I say to my father, you should have slapped me. He's never raised his hand on me. You should have told me. You should have taunted me. He's there and Allah bless him. And they're all such noble people, but they are the lights of God. Can you see that? So when the parent talks, sometimes they talk with a harsh tone because they needed to speak in that way. Now I'm going to clarify this point as we go on. Today I'm going to tell you the references, but I don't want you to go into your smart devices because it will take too much time. You go to an Arab pagan environment as a prophet, right? These people complain that we don't see enough bloodshed. We don't see enough looting. These people burn under the sun, thirst, killing, pillaging, plundering, women being swapped from one man to another as spoils of war. You go to these people and you say, you know what? Allah will put you to death and they will just laugh at you. They'll say, we live to kill and die. Abu Jahl, when he was being killed, Abu Lahab, he said to his former slave, get a free man to cut my head off, not you. He said, well, what difference does it make to you? You're going to die anyway. He said, no, 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 my pride will not allow it. Get a free man to cut my head. He said, no, I'll cut your head at Badr. He said, okay, then cut it with my sword because it's, it's, it's an expensive sword. He said, no, I'll cut it with my sword. He said, then in that case, cut it from the shoulder so I look magnanimous and great on the end of the spear. He said, no, I'll cut it from the chin. Imagine people with that mindset. You tell them, yeah, yeah, you're going to go into the hot place and you're going to burn for a while. So we're burning under the sun anyway. How do you talk to these people? How do you talk to hardened criminals? You have to tell them you're going to burn. You're going to be drinking molten copper. There will be tar around you. There will be flames as big as camels. That's what the Quran says, right? And then when you're thirsty, you'll be given boiling water. And when your skins burn, we'll replace them with other skins. It's all true. But that's the tone with which you talk to hardened criminals. Isn't it? Then the Quran also employs another tone. It's phenomenal the way the parent is talking. يَا أَيُّهَا الْإِنسَانِ مَا غَرَّكَ بِرَبِّكَ الْكَرِيمَ الَّذِي خَلَقَكَ فَسَوَّاكَ O human soul, such a noble tone. What has deceived you from your Lord, the one who has created you, the one who has set you upright? فَعَدَلَكَ And he balanced you. فَأَيَّ سُورَةٍ مَا شَاءَ رَكَّبَكَ 
in whichever form he wanted you, he brought you out. Do you deny the day of resurrection? Upon you are people who are recording every one of your deeds. Look at the nobility Quran gives to the human being. Look at the soft tone. And then at a higher level, the Lord says, Ud'uni astajib lakum. Call me. I am here. I haven't left your side. Irji'i ila rabbiki radiyatan mardiya. Return to your Lord. As the souls were maturing, the tone was reflecting that mature attitude towards them. So when people say, why is Quran so severe? There are two things here. That it is ordained from God. But the tonality of it is befitting the situation at hand. And then if you see the growth of the soul, as the soul grows, the tone is softened to a very calm, emotional tone and a spiritual tone. Read the Quran in its entirety and see all these things that are happening within the Quran. I'm going to ask you to look at Surah Nahal verses 1 to 22 but in your good time yeah in your good time not not right now I, I want to continue with the so this surah from verse 1 all the way to the verses that I'm going to recite it's talking of the favors of God continuous favors you guide yourselves by the sun by 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 the stars at night you have ships by which you sail he sent you cattle rain clothes wool fur he has given you all of this it's Nothing but the blessings of God. These verses are talking about the blessings of God. Until he comes and says, Is the one who creates like the one who does not create. Do you not remember? Where have you become lost? Remember. If you were to begin to count the bounties of God, you will never be able to count them. Inna Allah la ghafuru rahim. Allah is most forgiving, most merciful. So He's saying, every favor of mine is on you. You will not be able to enumerate them. This world, your life, is a favor. And in addition to that, God is most forgiving, most merciful. Then look at the verse. وَالَّذِينَ يَدْعُونَ مِن دُونِ اللَّهِ لَا يَخْلُقُونَ شَيْئًا وَهُمْ يُخْلَقُونَ And the people that they call other than Allah, have not created anything. They have been created. They are dead. They are not alive. And those people themselves don't know when they will be resurrected. Your God is one God. Therefore, the people who do not believe in the hereafter and the last meeting with God, look at the reason the Quran gives. Mun kiratun wahum mustakbirun. Their heart are in denial, and they are people who are behaving with arrogance and pride. Can you see that? Something has gone on. There is an embedded deep level of shirk within us. The people that we follow other than God is only a reflection of the real thing that is inside there. And the whole purpose of this life is for us to get it out of us. To acknowledge it and to remedy it and to finish it off as we move on to God. Now on this note, I mean, people have asked me to say this. That is it shirk to say, Yali Madad? Then look, to the best of my knowledge, from my reading of the Quran, saying Yali Madad is not shirk. Yes? There is a distinction between an act of shirk and shirk as a commitment and attitude. And a mushrik as somebody who has been branded as being within the fold of shirk. But is it good practice? No. The Prophet did not say such a thing, Imam Ali did not say such a thing, Imam Hassan, Imam Hussein, they didn't commit themselves to these utterances. Yeah? And Imam Sadiq would not approve of it. That also has to be acknowledged. It is not a part of Sharia and it is not good practice. But is it an act of shirk? I will say there is a big difference between saying Ya Ali Madad and even an act of shirk. But even if something was an act of shirk, it does not necessarily constitute shirk because shirk is constituted by an attitude. If somebody says Ya Ali Madad and they feel Imam Ali is a demigod, independently as, uh, uh, taking his discretions, then that attitude, internal attitude would 
be an attitude of shirk. Yeah? So saying, Ya Mother, in and of itself is not shirk. So, I mean, we need to get these things right. I don't find anything in the Quran that gives credibility to the statement that saying Yali Madat is shirk. It's not shirk, to the best of my understanding. Yet it is not best practice at all by any shot. And even the Prophet and Imam Ali would definitely stamp it out of the community if they were here. The tests that are given to us in this world are only there for us to reveal what is hidden within us. Surah Ali Imran 179. God will not let you be in the state that you are until he distinguishes between the wholesome and unwholesome that is within you. All of this is meant to come out so that you can see this is the problem. Then look at the role of God within the community. He is saying, no matter how evil you may be, do not despair, God forgives all sins. The message of Quran is just be God-centered, fully God-centered. That's it. Nothing else. <laughs> Say to my creatures, do not despair of the mercy of God. God forgives every sin. Can you see the unrestricted tone of this verse? The Prophet went to barbaric people who knew nothing but killing. They had blood dripping from their hands. People burying their daughters. These were the remedies. Do not despair. Do not despair. There is still time and there's still chance. And God is one who is unrestricted. He can forgive whatever he wants for whoever he wants. And he forgives all sins. Even in one place it says he does not forgive shirk. But in another place, it says, if he forgives all sins, just try and be good. You know, it's such a great shame. And I'm going to go through this, that today people behave so foolishly and they said, ah, oh, I don't want to pray and I don't want to look because I don't gain anything from prayers. I'm going to go through it in a little while. The thing is, all you got to do is to make a gesture, whether it does anything for you or not, if it pleases your parent, your Lord, your God, despite all the inner inadequacies, He will honor you. How many a times we know that our children are not doing these things that they do for us through love? And I'm looking at my children when I say that. Uh, but, you know, as parents, as parents, we know that they are doing it because we have asked them to do. And that wins our hearts. But God is the one if his heart, and of course God doesn't have a heart, I know what clips are going to be made about God's heart. God's heart, I'm going to say it anyway. If God's heart is touched, he can purify our hearts fully. How foolish are we? Think about this. How foolish is this human? You're not even microscopic. On an earth which is not microscopic, in Milky Way which is not microscopic, and you actually say this about the Lord who has created all of it and who is needless? Foolish human. Think about things before you say them. Foolish. It's like somebody going to the doctor. The doctor says, go for a walk 20 minutes every morning. Ah, it doesn't do any good for me. I'm going to instead listen to some soothing music. How foolish can you be? This man is telling you after years of experience, just because you don't feel any change in your health doesn't mean your health is not getting better, right? This is the foolish attitude that you face in 21st century. People don't want to abide by Sharia. Are we fools? He doesn't have to give us a Sharia. He has given it for us ourselves. Yes, it's another question altogether that the jurists have misinterpreted Sharia altogether and they've made it into nothing but forms. That's another problem that fast for two hours and fast for 22 hours. That's the Jewish problem. But the fast in itself, salah in itself, forget the jurist what they are saying, that if you bounce your head, your namaz is broken and whatever, you know, fatwas they come out with. But what about standing there? Lord, I stand here. I don't feel any spiritual gain from it. I stand here because I value you. What about that simple intention? It means everything to God. 
and it will mean everything to us on the day when we stand before the judge. It's foolishness, serious foolishness, that people say, don't pray and drink alcohol and do this and do that. And the blessed prophet Muhammad said, I do not want alcohol consumption in my community. End of story. That's my prophet saying it. How foolish can we be? A man who gave his life, his effort, every single thing to deliver to us that pure message and to purge us from inner shirk and kufr and darkness, bring us into light. We are saying this to that man, a man who heads a community of two billion people. So simply we say that to the Prophet Muhammad, seriously? And then we gather to commemorate Imam Hussein and the finest soul to lead us to God is Hussein ibn Ali. I will not deny that. Beyond anyone that I have seen. It is nothing but the love of Hussein that purges us. These people, look at them, how they were. What's wrong with our brains? I'm not obviously saying to the immediate audience, I'm saying to those online as well, yes? Who are all my children. Because I've given myself right now the title of a father for the community. People who have fornicated, who have killed, who have sinned. Look at what the Quran says. Amongst them, whoever decides to turn, bring faith in God. Try to make an attempt to do righteous deeds. Allah will turn all their evil deeds into good deeds. That is Allah. That is Allah. That is Allah. No matter how much sins you have committed, just now try. And Allah will turn all the previous evil deeds into good deeds. Now, I don't know how authentic this hadith is, but I'm going to say it. Somebody went to the Prophet. He said, when can God forgive me? He said, one year before your death. And he said, no, nah. one month before your death. And he said, no, one week before your death. One day before your death. He said, at the time when your death approaches, ask him and he'll forgive you. Then he pauses and he said, no, when it reaches here. And when you're about to escape your body. Turn to him and he can forgive you. That is God. Otherwise, God would not be God. In the Quran, we find that God rewards the best of deeds and forgives the worst of deeds. He said, I will not reward little deeds of yours, but the best deeds that you've committed from in there, I will reward all of them. And the Quran is clear that even in this namaz and this fasting that you pray without any meaning in your heads, he will reward all of them. The Quran is saying, of course, we haven't had the time to go through these debates and, and, and these subjects. But even if somebody just prays for the sake of God, wants me to pray, and there's nothing in there, God says he will reward all of that. Because at least you made a show of it. Yep, that's enough to absolve you of your crime that you're guilty of in another phase of life. Yeah, at least you tried. Now, anybody who thinks that the Sharia is something that God needs, look at these verses. Kul ma saltukum min ajrin fahuwa lakum. Say to them, O Muhammad, whatever reward that I have sought from you is for you yourself. That's the favor of God. I am telling you, do right, don't do wrong. Pray, fast, do hajj, give zakat. All of this, the benefit is yours, not for me. In another place, the Quran says, Kul ma sa'altu ma as'alukum alayhi min ajrin illa man sha'a an yattakhid ila rabbihi sabila. Say, I do not ask you upon whatever I've delivered any reward except for the one who wants to make his path back to Allah. Remember those verses we cited? in which the Iblis is challenging the Lord. He said, take them all, but this is my straight path leading to me. Iblis said, I will sit on your straight path and I will prevent them all from coming to you. He said, look, do whatever you want, but this is my straight path leading to me. They deserve to be there and that's a favor on them, but that's my straight path. So here the Quran he says, look, whatever I ask you as a reward, it is only for the one who wants to go back to his Lord. Yeah? Don't belittle the Sharia. Now, if anybody is in any doubt about God, 
and what God really is and who God is. Let's explore certain verses. Surah An'am 151, 153. Look at them afterwards. Look at them afterwards. The Quranic code, read it. They're scattered in the Quran. Qul ta'alu atlu ma haram Allah alaykum. Come to me, I will tell you what God has made haram. Do not do shirk with him. Be good to your parents. Do not kill your children through the fear of poverty. We feed you and we will feed them. Do not approach indecencies what is apparent and what is hidden. Do not kill a faultless soul. This is what God tells you. Do not go near the wealth of an orphan, save for you to do good to them. Be true in your transactions. Take proper measures and give proper measures. Be just. God will not burden any soul beyond what it can bear. And when you give your word, then be true to it. And do justice, even if it is with your, uh, with your close ones. And this is the path leading to me straight. What does God want? Does he want us to go and kill people? Steal from people, swear and shout at people. Look at what God is telling us in the Quran. It's nothing but a moral message. It's such a beautiful message. The God of the Quran is a moral God. He's not asking us for anything. He says, you can't do anything for me because I'm needless. But this is what I'm asking you to do. This is what I call Quran spiritual morality. Then look at the Qurans and these verses are everywhere. And look at Quran's spiritual virtues. And these are in several places. But Israel, 36 to 38. But I'm only going to read a few verses. Do not commit yourselves to things of which you have no knowledge. In the sam'a wal basara wal fuada kullu ulaika kana anhu mas'ula. Your ears, your sight, and your heart. All of them will be asked. وَلَا تَمْشِي فِي الْأَرْضِ مَرَحَا Do not walk upon the land boastfully. إِنَّكَ لَنْ تَخْرِكَ الْأَرْضِ You will not break the earth beneath you. وَلَنْ تَبْلُقَ الْجِبَالَ طُولَا And when you stand so haughtily, you will not rise up to the level of a mountain. كُلُّ ذَلِكَ كَانَ سَيِّهُ عَنْدَ رَبِّكَ مَكْرُوهَا the evil of these things are abhorred by your Lord. In another verse, وَعِبَادُ Rahman, الَّذِينَ يَمْشُونَ عَلَى الْأَرْضِ هَوْنَا The creatures of God, when they walk upon the earth, they walk with humility. وَإِذَا خَاتَبُهُمُ الْجَاهِلُونَ قَالُوا السَّلَامَ And when the ignorant people talk with them, they say, Assalamu alaikum. Trust me, I've had many people saying Assalamu alaikum to me. And I said, look, I'm not one of those, but whatever. وَالَّذِينَ يَبِيتُونَ لِرَبِّهِمْ سُجَّدًا وَقِيَامًا And the people who spend their nights for their Lord in sajda and standing. وَالَّذِينَ يَقُولُونَ رَبَّنَا صْرِفْ عَنَّا عَذَابَ جَهَنَّمْ And the people who plead with God that remove the abab of Jahannam from us. Until you come to these verses. وَالَّذِينَ يَقُولُونَ رَبَّنَا هَبْلَنَا مِنْ أَزْوَاجِنَا وَذُرِّيَاتِنَا قُرَّةَ عَيُّنٍ وَجْعَلْنَا لِلْمُتَّقِينَ إِمَامًا O Lord, grant us from our spouses, offspring that are the apples of our eyes. And Lord, make us leaders for the God conscious. These are the virtues of the Quran. And look at the beautiful, beautiful way the spiritual virtues are discussed in the Quran. In Surah Maryam, I think, إِذَا تُطْلَ عَلَيْهِمْ آيَةُ Rahman خَرُّوا سُجَّدًا وَبُكِيَّا when the ayat of Rahman are recited upon them, their hearts move and they fall crying in prostration. When they begin to recognize the Rahman and begin to become absorbed of their own arrogance. And those people whose hearts tremble when the verses of God are read upon them. What I'm trying to say here is that there is something wrong in there, in all of us. And that is why we are here. The role of God is to liberate us, to bring us back to himself. And amongst the most prominent names of God is the name Wali, the intimate friend. 
اللہ ولی الدین آمن و یخرج من الظلمات الى النور اللہ از دا ولی آف دا پیپل ہو برنگ فیت ہی پرجز دیم فرام ڈارکنیس اینڈ برنگز دیم ان ٹو لائٹ آن دی ادر ہینڈ اللہ سیز اللہ از دا لائٹ آف دی ہیونس ان دی ارتھ دین اگین دا قرآن سیز یو ول سی دیر لائٹ اسٹریمنگ اہیڈ آن دا ڈے آف قیاما اینڈ دے ول سی رب نا اتمیم لنا نور نا او لورڈ کمپلیٹ آور لائٹ فور ایس The whole idea of this worldly life is for us to be spiritually aligned with God. You see, we have only known God, only known God through fear and as a master. The whole religion has become bodily. We want paradise because the body rejoices with bounties. We don't want hell because the body pains and Anguish comes psychologically with body torment. Can you not see that? The whole idea, go beyond life and death. Go beyond richness and poverty. Go beyond sickness and health. Embrace the beauty wholeheartedly. Go beyond paradise. Go beyond hell. How phenomenal is Ali who says, cast me in hell. But oh Lord, if I don't find you in there, then how will that be bearable by me? Does he not say that in the day in Dua Al-Kumail? How will I bear your absence in hell? But if you are with me, then let it burn me to ashes. Doesn't Ali say, throw me into hell. I will tell everybody there that I'm in love with the one who burns me. It was never meant to be this bodily paradise and bodily hell. That's where we are. We are immersed in the bodily. We are immersed in aggression. in anger, in desire, and none of these states have to be evil if we can direct them accurately. So the whole idea is to be aligned spiritually with God. And God has made that very possible for us by calling himself Wali, by calling himself Rab. He is the parent. He is the intimate friend. And I just want to say one thing here before we move on. that the greatest favor God has done upon us is that he has made himself available to us at a private and a personal level as a friend. You see, we are always worshiping the God of the throne, the God of the galaxies, the God of the known and the unknown. But beyond the God that is unspoken, words cannot capture, that is the overwhelming one, the most majestic one, The one whose name cannot be uttered. The one at whose name the throne and its inhabitants tremble in awe. Beyond that God is the God of the heart. Imagine the favor of God that he has made himself available for us here. That is the God who says, I am closer to you than you yourself. Allah yahul bain al-mar'i wa qalbihi. Allah comes between a man and his own soul. Hussein said, Oh Allah, how do I articulate my thoughts when you know what I am thinking before I even think it? How, O oh Lord, you are that proximate to me. If we can find that God and the confidence with that God, then I think we've done it. Then we have done it. To say to Allah, oh Allah, I have been embarrassed from the whole world. I need someone from whom I do not feel embarrassment. Look at me, O oh God, for I am not hidden from you. The despicable me or whatever I am, I am available to you. You have accepted me as I am. O oh Lord, this is what troubles me. O oh Lord, and say it to him, openly say it to him, O oh Lord, I don't trust you, and I know I don't trust you, and you know I don't trust you. O oh Lord, I think you're not kind, and you know that I think you're not kind. O oh Lord, I think this is all useless, and you know I think that. Approach God in that honesty, and let God work his magic from there. The Blessed Prophet said, God has said, I'm so vast that I cannot be contained within everything I've created. 
but I am accommodated in the heart of my lover and my servant. Imagine, the private God is my God. I don't have to share him with anybody. It's my unique relationship with God. You may be the God of the throne and the God of the universe and the God of Gabriel and the God of Prophet Muhammad, but you are my God. And I have that confidence. No matter how despicable or whatever I may be, but I am yours and I take pride in that. There's a hadith of the Prophet from the Sunni sources, and I don't distinguish between Sunni Shia sources, and I have a very different way of understanding hadith. That on the day of Qiyamah, God will summon his creatures and he will say, do you know all those things that you did in the worldly life and I covered it all up? The creature will say, yeah. He said, well, I will not expose it today either. I will cover it all up even now. In another hadith, this is a Shia one, that God will say, my pride does not allow me to expose my creatures as a parent covers the sins and the misdeeds of their children. Imam Ali says in Dua Komedu, and forgive me those of my crimes that you have concealed from your proximate angels who are the scribes and write down everything I do. Because God feels a sense of embarrassment from the angels knowing what his creatures have promised and then broken. So they have said, God forgive me. And in the next breath, they revert. God says, here, I feel embarrassed that they should see these deeds. So he covers them up. If only we could understand God. If only we could understand God. How can anybody after knowing God live without God? How? You know, I always say, if God wants me to fast for 23 hours, I will fast with pride. If God wants me to pray 20,000 salat, I will pray with pride. I have to know that my God wants it. Even if it doesn't make any difference to me, any change, but because my God wants it. Reverence of God. Now, how do we approach God after that private level? You see, in the face of him being the judge, he will dispense with justice, make no doubt. Even if it's a weight of a seed, he will bring it out. In Allah Latif, God is subtle. He will bring it out and it will be placed on the scale. He will dispense with justice. He will tell you, Ma kuntum fihi takhtalifun, all the quarrels you used to have. He will pass decisive judgment. Who said what? He will conduct justice. Make no doubt. He will. But the judge is also a parent. But the judge is also Rahman and Rahim. And the judge is also my wali. And the judge is also the one apart from whom I have no one. Can you see that? Within a judge is a parent. Within a parent is a friend. Within a friend is the blind lover. As Imam says, if you were to take to me to task for my crimes, I will hold you to your forgiveness. It's the night of Ashura. The enemies are drawing closer to the tents of Hussein. Abbas, what is it that they want? They want to engage in battle. Allow, ask them to allow us a respite of a night. For I wish to spend this night in the devotion of my God, in isolation and on my own. Abbas speaks with them. They postpone the warfare till dawn. Imam Hussein is in his tent. Imam Zainul Abidin said, I was in an adjoining tent. My aunt, was nursing me. Hussein came into his tent and he said, O oh, time, sorrow be your lot. At daybreak and at sunset, 
for how many have awoken desirous of you, only for you to conceal them beneath the earth by nightfall. Every soul shall tread my path, and time will expect accept no substitution. He said, I heard this and I realized what my father was saying. The tears choked me. He repeated it again, and my aunt jumped from her place, tearing her clothes and saying, Oh, brother, then that means I will lose my brother. As she cried, Hussein said, Bear it with patience, O Zainab. She said, Oh, brother, they will kill you violently, and that is too difficult for my soul to bear. She lost consciousness, Imam Zunul Abidin says. Imam Hussein sprinkled some water upon her face and she regained consciousness. Zainab, your tribulations will be severe, but I ask you to bear it for the sake of God. Let the devil not deprive your heart of contentment and patience. Imam Hussein busies himself in his devotion. Zainab goes to other tents. After a little while, the love of her brother overpowers her heart. She goes back to the tent of Hussein and finds it unguarded. She looks inside and sees Hussein in supplication, but filled with emotions and rage, she said, How dare this tent is left unguarded on such a night? Indeed, I shall go and reprimand the Bani Hashim. She comes, she hears sounds from the tent of Abbas and his brothers. She lifts the cloth and she sees Abbas in the center of his tent, polishing his blade and the Hashimis around him. He calls out, O sons of Hashim, what have you decided for tomorrow as the battle breaks out? They said, O Abbas, O master, the decision is yours. Command, and we shall obey. He said, tomorrow, when the battle breaks out, none of the helpers of Hussein should be killed before us. Least anyone says that Hussein favored his family above his companions. She was filled with emotions. As she left his tent, she heard similar sounds emanating from the tent of Habib. She drew closer and she found Habib in the center of the tent in a similar manner and the Ansar were around him. He called out, O oh Ansar, why have you left your hometowns? Why have you come here? What shall you do tomorrow when the battle breaks out? O oh Habib, O oh Master, the command is yours. Command and you will find us obliging. He said, tomorrow when the battle breaks out, we will be the first ones to give our lives. For none shall say that the companions valued their lives beyond the family of Hussein. As she retreated, she found Hussein in front of her. She broke into a faint smile. He said, oh sister, I have not seen the smile upon your face since we left Medina. What be the cause of your joy? She explained to him. He said, these are the finest men. I have not found companions better than these, like pure water, unadulterated with impurities. O oh, Zainab, do you wish to see their resolve? Yes, O oh, dear brother. Then stand behind that tree. O oh, Abbas, O oh, Bani Hashim, hasten to me. O oh, Habib, O oh, Ansar, come to me. They come running. He says, oh, people know well that these people will put me to death tomorrow. By your deaths, I will not be spared. I lift the oath of allegiance from you. Take the covering of the night and save your lives. As Hussein said this, they stood they said, Hussein, command us and we will behead ourselves. Do you doubt our loyalty? 
What life is a life without you? Hussein said, no, that none shall live. Muslim Ibn Awsaja spoke. He said, Hussein, I will fight your enemies with my spear tomorrow. When it breaks with my sword, when it breaks, I shall throw stones at them. Then I shall fight them with my bare hands. Hussein, if I'm killed and then burnt, I will plead to God to restore me 70 times over that I may defend you all over again. Hussein commended them. Then he said, no, that after my death, my women folk, my sisters and my daughters will be taken as captive. There is a clan nearby, the clan of Bani Asad. Take your women and escort them there so that they may be safe. Ali ibn Madahir, the brother of Habib, comes to his tent. His wife asked, what was Hussein saying? He said, he said, that we will be killed and our women will be taken as captive. So take your women to the clan of Bani Asad. She said, and what have you decided? Prepare and I shall take you. She said, sorrow be your lot. Shall Zainab be taken as captive and your wife be spared? Give your life for Hussein and let me be. I hear this and I've read this and I'm conveying a sentiment. In the depth of the night, Hussein exits his tent and goes towards the battlefield. Somebody walks behind him. Hussein turns and he said, what is, this, what is it that you do? He said, I am fearful that the enemy might mount an attack. So I come to protect you. He said, come near me. He says, Hussein, what is this that you do? He said, I examine the land, its highs and its lows, its trees and its ditches, to see from where the enemy can ambush us. It is possible that Hussein was walking and at a point he breathes a deep sigh. And he asks, why, O oh Hussein? He said, maybe this is the place where my Abbas will fall. The night of Ashura breaks into dawn. The battle commences. They engage with the enemies. Hussein's numbers depleted. By the afternoon, a handful are left. One by one, they give their lives until Abbas breathes his last. Hussein comes to the tent of Abbas, looks inside and cries out, La hawla wa la quwwata illa billah. Comes to the tent of Habib, looks inside and cries out, La hawla wa la quwwata illa billah. He prepares to ascend his steed for his final battle, looks on and cries out, Hal min nasir yansuruna, Hal min mughith yughithuna, Hal min daab yadubban haram ali ras an haram rasulillah. Is there a helper who will assist us? Is there an aid who will come and defend the honor of the household of the Prophet? There is silence, and then there are cries from the tent. Hussein quickly comes to the tent and says, has a child died? And they say, no, but your Azgar will die of thirst. Take him, O oh brother, and see if they give some water. Imam Hussein hides his Asghar under his cloak, rides up to the enemy, 
not knowing what he has, they look on. He draws his cloak away and lifts Asgar. He said, O oh people, what crime has this child committed against you? Do you not see how he dies of thirst? If you have any cause, it is against me. Why let this child die of thirst? If you feel that I shall drink your water, then come and place a drop of water in his, own, in his mouth by your own hands. As Hussein pleads with them, the enemies begin to weep and turn their faces away. Umar ibn Sa'd, surmising the mood, says to Hurmala, Iqta' kalam al Hussein. Silence, Hussein. Hurmala places his arrow into his bow and makes Hussein his target. As the soldiers are crying, Hurmala's hand trembles. He tries again and his hand trembles. I say, Hurmala, do you see the mother of Asgar? At the tents. Umar ibn Sa'd said, Hurmala, finish him off. As Hussein trembles with Asgar upon his hands, the arrow leaves the bow and penetrates within the tender neck of Asgar. It is said that it tears it apart from ear to ear. The scene is so shocking that Hussein is left without speech. He begins to tremble violently. And as the blood of Asgar oozes and drops into the palm of Hussein, he realizes that Asgar has died. He moves a few steps forward and cries out, Inna lillah wa inna ilayhi raja'oon then moves a few steps back. He looks at Asgar and he said, Oh Asgar, like this shall we be raised in front of Allah and your grandfather. Then he wipes his beard with the blood of Asgar. At this point I ask Hussein, Oh Hussein, why do you not have the resolve of taking little Asgar back to the tent? Why do you tremble so? You have carried bodies all day long. This is a weightless body. And Hussein replies to me, you know not. He has a mother waiting for him. To whom I have promised that I shall bring back your child quenched of his thirst. How am I to give him back at this in this state? Matame Hussein. Because if you were to look at the fiqh rulings and you look at the Qur'an, you'll say, come on, this is totally in opposition to the spirit of the Qur'an. So as far as fiqh is concerned, yes, those meanings can change the, the laws. But by and large, the faqih doesn't uh, follow the verses. And in my own system, it's form and essence. So I would be going through all of those variety of meanings and trying to work out the essence as opposed to form. In terms of the verses that I have quoted, yes, it can be impactful uh, in uh, trying to draw out the meaning. But the thing is that when you collate differing verses and you bring them together, then you, have, you arrive with an accurate understanding because it's not just one verse. You're looking at several different verses in which the meanings that we are trying to derive are, in sev are presented in several different contexts. So you can decipher the meaning in those verses by collating the verses and looking at them properly and accurately. Yeah? So the, the second part of the question then talks about the historicity of the Quran. So just paraphrasing again, um, the oral tradition is not reliable for preserving texts and now there are many manuscripts that have been found that differ from the Quran 
and then it says Westerners are now creating models for how the Quran could have been created like they did with the Bible. These questions are growing in academia and if Muslims refuse to answer this question, then the West will. See Corpus Quranicum. So that's a German-led research effort um, to do a historical textual analysis of all pre uthman scripts. The time of the Prophet have been found, that's the first thing, but early, yes. And you have discrepancies, absolutely. So you can't be sure, according to that line of research, whether the Quran you have here is unadulterated from the beginning till the end. Yeah? And the hadith that we have, and that we, we know there is a huge problem with that line of research. <clears throat> However, when I'm asked, do you think the Quran is the one that was ordained and given by the Prophet? I said, yeah, absolutely. I said, why? You can't prove its historicity. You know there's a mess. I said, no. For me, I look at the validity of the Quran in a very different way. I'm looking at it in terms of its style, in terms of its consistency, in terms of its endings, in terms of its rhythmic sounds. Otherwise, Imam Ali also questioned the word of the Quran. He said, should it be this or this? So Imam Ali said to him, his companion, are you telling me that this is not accurate? He said, I'll just follow whatever is there. Obviously, there may be pronunciations that differ. There might be a word, you know, somewhere that should be another word as opposed to the one that is there. That's not a problem. But the overall style of the Quran is so phenomenal. The sequences of the verses, the repetition of those verses are exactly accurate. The endings of the verses. Then you go into the moral content of the Quran. There you can see the moral message of the Quran is consistently the same. Then you look at the eschatology of the Quran and you think eschatology about Qiyamah, the weights, the destruction of the world, the accountability, consistency. Then you look at the spirituality of the Quran, the psychological sort of spirituality, which I call spiritual virtues and alignment with God, you say perfectly aligned. God's centricity is perfectly there. The stories, well, you can then collaborate them with the Bible, biblical stories, and you say, well, there are certain differences, but uh, minute differences. So it is here that I say that, no, the moral message of the Qur'an is the same. The spiritual message of the Qur'an is the same consistently. The style of the Qur'an is the same. Now, if a verse of Salah is omitted or is added, it doesn't make any difference to the message of the Qur'an. But the amazing thing is about the Qur'an, the one that we have, even the numbers of words, there's a high level of consistency. So, for example, heaven and hell male and female. So the research that people have done, although I haven't done that research, I just, you know, benefit from their research. They are all balanced out, equal numbers. Can you see that? So you think, well, this highest level of consistency in there, in such a lot of areas of the Quran, I'm perfectly sure that, yeah, this is the Quran that was given by the Blessed Prophet. As a faithful, now this is as a person who wants to lead his life on the basis that this Quran is accurate. So when you go to the deepest analysis of we, I, he, you find a phenomenal level of consistency there as well. That no, it's not faltering. And the beauty of the Quran is that this we, I, he, they, it could have concealed it. But the Quran wanted to leave it open. Same as the biblical sort of text that you have. So you say, well, it's not shy. It doesn't want to hide anything. It's giving it. And the people who are transcribing it were also doing it with integrity. But as a faithful, the Quranic verse says to the Prophet, لا تحرك به لسانك لتعجل به. Muhammad, don't be in haste to give it out. We will preserve it, we will collect it, we will apportion it. That's the Quran saying. And the Quran says in another verse, we have revealed the dhikr and we will protect it. So, not as a, an academician or as a scholar, as a faithful, I'm saying, yeah, I have faith that those verses, somehow, through some agency, the minds were inspired and it came together. You know, the thing with academia is that it's a good, lovely method, but at times it's arrogant, just like the scientific method. The scientific method should be based on no finality, which 
in principle it is. But a few years ago, we were told telepathy is nonsensical and just a load of nonsense. Now that we explore it more and we are able to talk about it, give it proper words, it becomes a discipline. Right now, the world of the jinn, the interdimensional world, well, until now it was all nonsense and myth and whatnot. Now that we are opening up, our scientific mind is opening up to interdimensional worlds, now we are beginning to innovate language. Once we innovate language, befitting words, we will talk about the world of the jinn. Jinn means the one that is veiled. Yeah? In a more appropriate manner. Some, I just find sometimes academia and, and the scientific world is very Arab. For oh, finality, this is what I can prove. Beyond that, I don't know. I'm supposed to denial of it. Yeah? Can I push back a little bit? So can I push back a little bit? So I, th I think that from reading the questioners' comments, I think there was a comment made in the first lecture that when we were brought up, we were told we couldn't question certain things. And you referred to people on the sides and, and yourself. <laughs> Um, and I think this probably comes from someone who's been brought up in a society where we're asked to question everything. And I think um, some of the, I would say, elder religions that elder, elder religions have been through a period of, you know, they've been subject to questioning. Do you think there is any scope to question this? Is this the thing you're saying not to question? Or, 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 or could we question the, the accuracy of, of this as well? norm. Denial is arrogance. That, that's what I'm trying to say. No, no, no. Question. Question if Quran makes any sense. If it is from God, if it, whatever it's from. Question. Reject it if it doesn't make any sense to you. But in the process of questioning, we shouldn't be arrogant enough to say without proof that it is unauthentic. You can say, well, I don't believe in it, but I can't say. It's like the 12th Imam. You know, I say to the people who say, that I don't believe in it. I say, look, that's an arrogant statement. At the most, you can say, I have not been able to prove it. I say, look, as far as I'm concerned, I'm perfectly satisfied that there's a 12th Imam, according to my own methods. Do you get it? If you can't prove it, if you can't prove it, then at most you say, I have no evidence to substantiate it. But you don't have a contrary evidence to prove that it doesn't exist either. Yeah, just be humble. Any question? Thank you. I'm going to ask a different topic of question. Um, I think this this is this is one which is particularly you know intriguing. Are angels immortal? Are they made of light and have wings? Are angels pure and cannot sin? And they obey and serve Allah at all times. Is Allah Subhanahu wa Taala creating more angels, or their numbers are fixed? And also, I think in the lecture you described that Jibril, uh, you made reference to Jibril's wings will cover the whole sky. So there are different types of angel as well. If you can expand on that, I think that's a question which has been asked. And Not comfortable with Muslim philosophers' understanding of angels. Yeah? They are conflating verses and generalizing them. Ma minna illa wallahu maqamum ma'alum. There is none amongst us but that we have our fixed position. This is a group, and I don't even know if that's angels. It's just, you know, something that they've assumed. That doesn't mean that every angel is of the same nature. I do believe that angels may not be what the philosophers have thought them to be. I feel there's, there's it's a broad term that subsumes a huge reality, and we need to go through angelology accurately from the Hadith of the Prophet and what the Orafa have quoted. I do feel some of them are very fallible and they can sin. I also feel, I don't know if I should say it, so I'm going to just stop there. I'm not going to say it. Okay? Are they eternal? If anything, if material and materiality is taken as a gauge, for temporality, then anything beyond materiality is endless. Yeah? Doesn't have a beginning, doesn't have an end. But then I also feel that the human soul doesn't have a beginning and doesn't have an end. We are 
eternal. We've been forever and we will stay forever. Yeah? We are as angelic in substance as angels can be. And the demons are the same as well. Yeah? Does God create more? Obviously, khalaqun alim. You will not find end to the words of God. Yeah, that's the verse of the Quran. You will not find any end to the words of God, right? I do believe that the prophets are also fallible. And the Quran confirms that. I do not believe that anything in this realm of existence, ours, the human condition, human condition does not understand infallibility. It just does not. It's inconsistent. All you can say is we can arrive at a state of optimality, not infallibility. Yeah? Optimality. That's it. But the realms intertwined with the world, I don't even feel they enjoy infallibility. Yeah? And my thoughts are still being worked out in my head and in my research. I feel we've got it wrong. Eternality. I think we've got it wrong. Deeply, I feel we've got it wrong. It needs thorough elaboration, a thorough, thorough elaboration. Wings, I'm not sure if it means the wings that birds have, yeah? Or if this is wings that are like really describing the function of transportation, yeah? He gives four and two wings and Yazidu fi khalqi man yasha and he increases in creation whatever he wants. You see, it is scary, I know, and it's confusing and it's going to take many, many, many years. Many, many, many years of a lot of work and a lot of calm preaching before certain things can be conveyed. But if we were to read the biblical books, read it, and you will say, mm, the wings don't mean what I think they do. They, are, they mean something far more tangible that I know. Can you see that? But to convey these things will take years upon years upon years and a very careful approach. I do feel that there's a reality that Quran did not want to hide. The Bible, Old One, Old Testament did not want to hide, and, and, and the New Bible, the parts of the Old Testament that it's kept. If I can cautiously make a suggestion that Muslims need to read the previous scripture, former scriptures, I'll tell you why. When an author writes a sequel, they're not going to repeat everything they've done in the they've written in the first one. They're just going to make references. It's just going to allude to it. The fact that the Quran says what you've been given, what we've been given is the same religion. Yeah? So there are many gaps in the Quran. And the Prophet said, we believe in everything revealed unto us and everything revealed before us. So there's that Muslim commitment to the previous scriptures as well. There's a commitment. What that commitment should impel the Muslim to do is to read the previous scriptures. I, for one, not only... I read the Abrahamic scriptures, but I read broader scripture as well, which I myself consider as Abrahamic as Abrahamic can be. The Hindu scriptures, for example, I read them. Yeah? To me, it's all one narrative. I, I don't see any discrepancies. It's a phenomenal way in which these are all different pieces of the puzzle and, you, and folklore and ancient tales and stories. I go through all of that. And you can see, subhanAllah, they all fit in beautifully. But the picture is not one that we would like to see and not one that we are comfortable with. It's going to take a very long time before the minds mature. Yeah? So no, my understanding of angels is very different. We have been very simplistic about them. There is a heck of a lot of nuance there. Same with jinn. Same with insan. Going to go to the floor for any questions. Anyone have questions? I have more from online, but wanted to give anybody the option if they wanted it.
Today you spoke about free will. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So what I said yesterday was, and then you missed the Q&A last night, that at an interactional level, we have freedom. How we interact with whatever has happened. That then can set a different trajectory. But as soon as that interaction is done, it sets a destiny again, fixed. That can change by the moment if we want. If we decide to stay in an awakened state, if we go back into a slumber, then we just become robotic. And then everything about us is predictable. As if a person has not lived. Yeah? It's an actor acting out. But when we awaken, there are different levels of awakening. We can awaken at a point of neutrality. And we can choose how to interact with any situation. Or we can awaken in a semi-awakened state where we interact in a predict predictable manner. And in another, uh, and some part of it, some part of our inner consciousness decides that I'm not going to be defeated by this or overjoyed by it. And then we are carving out the inner destiny. Yeah? The fact that I'm deciding to speak now. I'm going to say exactly those words that are in the head. Use the gestures that I'm used to using. I will look there because you're there. If there was a super brain here, it would give you my projection, exactly what I'm going to say in the same way that I'm going to say. It'll predict everything accurately. Yeah. In there, what is the free will? Everything is predicted. Everything is directed. The free will is that feeling I get of the ownership of my reaction. And that ownership that I get is making me inside or breaking me. So the Prophet said, you see, God knows everything because everything has already happened. But God at the level of the governor who governs has left the fate of damnation and salvation open at the level at which we are operating. So damnation and salvation is unknown. The Prophet said, you yourself will decide to inherit paradise and vacate hell or inherit hell and vacate paradise. He said, simultaneously, you're in both places. You will acquire one and vacate another one. It's you. It'll be on you. Yeah. So I don't mind talking more on this issue, but then you have a grand, grand soul, like the blessed prophet who, at the beginning of his prophetic career, would have prayed for change of destiny and a better destiny and people be guided and towards the end of his life. He was oblivious to any change of destiny. He would just say, oh Allah, whatever it is, I'm ready to accept. Because he came in that very neutral zone where he did not want his inner being to be affected at all. He just let the body and the circumstances lead their normal way and became purely fluid from within and fluidity. And I, and I do know that these discussions that I'm reply that I'm giving, replies I'm giving are very ambiguous. I, I know that I, I'm, I'm aware of that and my apologies for that. questions and comments and they all seem to have struck a personal chord with a number of people so I'm going to go through the comments and then maybe ask you a question to, to summarize just to get the tone of what people are possibly feeling um, so please don't answer them straight away <laughs> um, how, how can we be fully responsible of actions if they're impacted to not say directed by our genes environment and education isn't that an excuse for a huge part of evil in this world? 
if I give you two more, because they're all to do with evil in the world. The fact that when I hurt somebody and I feel responsible that I have hurt somebody makes me responsible. Can you see that? Intuitively, deep down, I know I have hurt somebody. Yeah? Now, you might say, well, the motivating factors were X, Y, and Z. I'll say, well, whatever the motivating factors were, the fact that I internally have taken the ownership of that act. Yeah? Now, consider this, that under the influence of some drug, you went and said things that hurt somebody's feelings. You will not take ownership of saying those things, but you will take responsibility that you shouldn't have been under the influence of drugs. So you'll still take ownership to a lesser extent. But now if somebody else drugged you up by deception, then you will say, I can't take any ownership of any of this. So in the first instance, by taking ownership, you yourself feel that quality in the soul that you have done wrong. In the second instance, you say, well, you know what? It was callous of me to do that, but I didn't mean any of those things. In the third instance, you will say, I equipped myself fully. I don't feel any remorse in there. You know, there is no remorse. There is nothing because I'm not responsible for it. The fact that we feel responsible shows that we are responsible. Yeah? We take ownership of it. According to Sheikh, Allah is too divine to experience the emotions of humans. Can I just finish that then? This idea and this. But I think it's a very good question. It's a very good question. So, Allah, the Huwa stage, he doesn't feel these emotions, yes? And yet. Allah feels every emotion because it's nothing but Allah. So now in the lectures, what we were trying to explain was the multifaceted approach that we have to God. If you want to single out God as God, then you say, well, he is beyond God. He is when there is no God, because the designation of God comes through his creative act. Yeah. So he as he doesn't feel emotions, but he as the creator understands emotions because emotions are a direct part of his creative abilities. So at that level, yes, he feels rage, he feels whatever he feels. But he, beyond being God, you see, designating the divine, the blessed one with the title of God is at a different level to him being himself. Yeah, Him being himself is beyond God. Him being God, there are two different levels. One is that he is the entirety of everything. Is the apparent hidden first last. Him being the author of humankind. That's where he can show anger and show love and show this. So it's, it's a way in which we understand God. But to reduce God to that level of someone who will hold grudges against people and punish and take joy and take pride and things like that. That is injustice to God. You have to be very careful how you word yourself. Yeah. So that's why not you, I mean we. You see, when we worship a God like that, then we become like that. We become vengeful, we become unforgiving. You see, in fit, we worship a God like that. You know, you do wudu from here, you know, that's it, I'm not going to accept it. Your namaz is batil and whatever else. What I'm trying to say here is, who is speaking at what level? How do we understand God? And therefore, yes, God can forgive one and all. 
you know, for him, God is God. I mean, we didn't get through those verses where the Quran makes an exception to the eternality of paradise and hell. It says, no, you live there forever unless God wishes otherwise. You see, the Quran gives that exception to God as God as the overall authority. What I'm saying is that he, the blessed one, is even beyond that authority. He as he. Now, a psychopath, yeah, the poor psychopath who is born with the psychopathic tendencies, they don't feel remorse. But I ask a question. What caused a psychopath to take birth as a psychopath? If it is a naive God that we are thinking of, then God becomes oppressive. You know, the person who is a psychopath says, why didn't you create me a psychopath? I mean, had you created me like Imam Ali, I would have been the finest of people. But you created me like a psychopath, and I turned out to be a monster. And for that, I'm going to burn because I've transgressed against other people. Right? Then God would become very unjust. So the question we were trying to deal with in this series of talks was, why does a psychopath emerge as a psychopath? Is it a consequence of a previous realm of existence? Or is it a choice that a person has made and said, look, I want a very difficult path here and I want to come through it accurately. Can you see that? There's a variety of interpretations that we can give. Yeah? But if you see this world off as the plane of our existence, then nothing makes sense. And that's why we were, we were trying to integrate a previous life, whereby this life can be justified. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Look into your own self. Every soul intuitively displays God. Yeah? We are parents, we are children, we are siblings, we are friends, we are those who are affectionate, and we are those who are harsh. We are those in some level of authority, we are those who are subordinate. We have all these beautiful aspects within us ourselves. With our children, sometimes we want to be harsh, but then it hurts us to see them hurt. Sometimes we want to be harsh for their own good. Sometimes we take pleasure in forgiving them to see them happy. Can you see that? So all the beautiful aspects of God are at times within us. We just have to explore it. Yeah? There is no difference in principle between grounding a child and between hell. There is no difference in principle, in essence. The severity of it does not bring about the essential difference. It just brings about difference in terms of grades of intensity. Yeah? By the way, I thought they were very difficult questions. Yeah. Yeah, uh, Sheikh, you know, it makes, you know, we've gone to say that our origin in this realm is rationally absurd and we need a previous realm to justify this realm. Could you not extend that and say that you also need then a previous realm to that to explain the previous realm? Because it seems to me at least even more absurd that we've come to this previous realm, we've done something, now we've forgotten and now we're here and now we have to pay for it it seems more rationally hard to accept than I was just started here. It says that there has to be, there has to be a realm prior to this in which everybody was at an equal footing. Now, how did we get into that realm? Yeah. So I had written, which it's been edited away now, so I'll write it again in a different paper that ultimately and inevitably it is God's choice. All of us, without fail, are the consciousness of God, individuated consciousness of God. So it's God's choice and God's justification 
that we be multiplied. Inevitably and eventually it will be God's choice to reclaim unity by fading away, by blotting out duality, where you and I will say it's justified. Yeah? That's my final analysis. Now, have there been previous realms or not? I can't deduce it beyond what I've been able to deduce, but I can't rule it out either. I cannot also rule out... No, I don't want to say this right now. I think it's a bit too too premature. No, just stop, stop at that. Yeah. So you see, when we say royal we, it means I of God. What I'm saying here is that if you examine the Quran, the we, maybe at some times it is the royal we. I'm not sure. At times it is not God as God. We are sure of that. God is not included in the we. At times, is it God and agencies with God that he himself has created? Possibly. At times the Quran changes the accent from we to I to we. What is happening there? It's too, too soon for me to give my thoughts on that. Yeah, it's way too early for, for any thoughts to be given on that. No, 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 Moses was called. And the voice spoke, Inni anallah, la ilaha illa ana. Indeed, I am Allah. There is no Allah but me. So, if you look at the Quran, it's, 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 it's really careful in the way it phrases things. And then when Moses was called, and he saw, Inni anastu nara, la li atikum minha bi qabasin, aw jadwatin minana, la allakum tastulun. Nudia, when he came, Nudia, he was called, Ya Musa, O oh Moses, you are at a blessed valley. And then, Inni an Allah. So the Quran at that point, whoever is talking to Moses begins to narrate the speech of God. So the natural sequence is not this, that we called him and we said, I am Allah. The sequence of the verse is when Moses drew near to the tree, he was called. You are inni and Allah. So then the Quran starts narrating through speech marks. So it, indeed I am Allah. Therefore you can see it's not a continuation of the speech of whoever is talking, but they are now narrate, they're quoting somebody else. Yeah? It's very careful the way Quran phrases itself. Extremely careful. Now this inni and Allah, la ilaha illa ana, the Quran celebrates it. Wa kallam Allah Musa taklima that God spoke with Moses. So the way to understand it for now is to say that that is a befitting expression of Allah in that moment. Yeah? Yeah. And for now, that is the best explanation. You see, had he started raining over there, probably Moses would have gotten wet. I mean, think about the context. It's night. Moses sees fire, so he's drawn, right? Do you think if there were lightning there, Moses would have gone? I know I'm being comical. Moses is with his family. He sees fire in a distance. He says, I may bring back a torch. So he's incentivized, wasn't he? Yeah? If it's night, yeah, no, 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 I know you didn't ask the question. If it's night, yeah, what else do you put for Moses to take notice of you? Yeah? What, what, what else can you give them? There are no televisions back in the day, right? I, I know I'm making it comical, but look, think about this. Think about the context. It's night. Moses is traveling. How would he be able to see the fire? How would he be able to see on top of the mountain that God is calling him? 
if it is not for a fire. No, and he also needed a torch. I mean, I'm just thinking, why fire? I'm saying, well, what else could you put there? Yeah? What else? Can anybody think of something else that you can put there? Considering that Moses is a shepherd, we are going back 5,000 years. There's nothing else there. Rain would not, Moses would not go towards rain, right? Thunder, lightning, and Moses would be afraid. What is going on there on top of the mountain? I'm not going to go there. So the only way Moses is going to go to, the, it's night, it's dark, there is a fire, I need a torch. So Moses is incentivized to go there, right? The Quran doesn't say talk to Moses uh, through the fire, by the way. Burning bush, right? So burning bush, but the thing is, the bush was burning. That's what drew Moses there. He wouldn't have gone otherwise. Why would he go? That was the only way to entice him. <laughs> I don't want to trivialize the question. I'm just trying to put the context to it. Yeah, whoever this man is, tell them to come over and, uh, you know, we can have a nice conversation in my room. Yeah, obviously, phenomenal question. What an intriguing, phenomenal question. Yeah. Going by the Quran. Going by the Quran. We will understand our arrival into this world, our pre-worldly existence, that we are responsible for our deeds. This was a pact that we made and we deserve justice. Yeah? That is the central theme of the Quran. What is in this story of Qiyamah, what is not central, what is not central is the identity of who the ultimate judge is. The central theme on the day of Qiyamah is us being cognizant that this is my judgment and I knew full well what I was doing and what the nature of life was going to be, and I forgot. Now, he, the Blessed One, does not arrive upon a throne. He, the Blessed One, cannot be seen with eyes. As Imam Ali said, you can't see him. He's not to be seen. The Quran says, but the faces will be looking at their Lord. So we know it is not Allah as Allah. It is some level of depiction of justice and God. Yeah? So I'm just saying, the central theme is not the identity. The central theme is our pact and the fact that we will be judged. Yeah. Yeah. So, I wanted to discuss this in these lectures, that there are two references, throne and chair. Chair is a much, much, much broader reference. Chair. And throne is a smaller reference, right? So, so the throne is a, you know, God made the earth and all of that. Wakana arshahu al alma, And his throne was on water. But when it comes to kursi, kursi wa samawati wal ard, wasi'a kursi wa samawati wal ard, his chair encompasses the heavens and the earth. Yeah? So, obviously, there is only so much we can speculate and talk about in such gatherings. But yes, reality could be very different than what we have imagined to be. And I think Quran makes that clear about the scrolls and things like that. But, fastawa al arsh, he ascended upon the throne. So, there is an arsh. And on the day of Qiyamah, that arsh will be carried by Samaniya 8. There is a seat of authority. 
but a God that we understand as God cannot sit on a throne and cannot be carried by angels. Can you see that? It can't be. So the reference point here either is a pure metaphor that earth, earth is a mechanism that is controlled by God or that the throne and the Arsh, the Arsh, the possessor of the throne, is not God as God, but a depiction befitting that realm. Yeah? You can't have God sitting on a throne. I mean, the God that we worship internally is formless, spaceless, cannot be contained. Yet he can have a depiction befitting a different realm. 